All right, so we're taking preventative care notes. These are notes from Chapter 7. Uh, they are 3.12. They are going to be going into the content section of your notebook or your binder. Keep in mind you are writing in two column notes as you are writing this. So we are doing Cornell style notes. All right, so we are going to first talk about preventative care or preventative medicine and what that actually is. So when you think of that word preventative, you are going to stop or prevent something from happening, right? So you don't want it to happen. So preventative medicine is when we are going to prevent a disease in animals. And then to be able to understand what that disease is, we're gonna define that to make sure we have a clear understanding and we're on the same page. So in our text, disease is then defined as any alteration from the normal state of health. So if I get a cut, technically that is a disease. If I have microorganisms that are um, impacting my intestinal tract, that is a disease. It's an alteration from what my normal state of being is. So we generally think of diseases as something huge, um, but they can be, you know, something that's small as well when we're working with this particular de uh, textbook definition. We have three major components of preventative medicine that we're going to be working within and talking about with this presentation. So we are going to be looking at what husbandry actually is, finally, once and for all. Uh, we're going to be talking about vaccinations and sanitation. So those are the three major components of preventative medicine. As long as we have husbandry, we successfully vaccinate and maintain a sanitary environment, then we will be able to prevent or have a very good chance of preventing our disease. Okay, so we've got animal husbandry first and foremost. So again, husbandry is not talking about marrying the animals. We are talking about housing the animal. So where is it living? We're talking about the diet. What is it eating? We're talking about the animal environment. So what is my climate? Um, what's my climate like? And then animal identification. So how do I keep track of which animal is which? So if I take a look at that image um, with the cows, I can see three out of those major components. So the only thing that I can't figure out is what type of environment the building is actually situated in. But I can see what their housing looks like. I can see what we're using as a form of identification. And I can also see some of the diet that's being presented. All right, when talking about housing, we want to make sure that we talk about the temperature of your housing environment. So we're gonna break this down into small animals. Our small, or small mammals rather, our small mammals are going to require 65 to 84 degrees Fahrenheit, or that's 18 degrees to 29 degrees Celsius. We're going to make sure that the environment's warmer for the young, for the elderly, for birds, and animals that have a sparse hair coat. So when we talked about those cats, those naked cats without any hair, or you've seen naked rats, or if I have a Chinese crested dog, there's not a good amount of hair on those. So that's what we were talking about, a sparse hair coat. So I am gonna have a warmer environment for those younger animals, the elderly animals, our birds, and animals with a sparse hair coat. Um, so those are for my small mammals. And extra credit point if you guys can email me what the one issue is with that piece in your notes. So we have large mammals. Uh, so our large mammals can tolerate cold as long as they're protected from the precipitation and the wind. So you're going to find what we call lean-tos on your farms or your ranches. If you have horses out in pasture, if you have cows, goats, sheep, any of those larger mammals, you're going to find these buildings that have three sides to them and, and then also a ceiling. And they're facing so the wind will prevent the the walls will prevent the wind from being able to hit those animals so there's going to be some sort of shelter uh, that way they can come in from the rain and they can stay warm that way so larger mammals are going to be able to tolerate cooler temperatures all right then we have lighting so lighting is very very important with our reptile friends uh, as well as our birds and 
Most of our mammals though are pretty good as long as we have enough light for what humans, right? So what we need for light is pretty good for them. So you guys with Zeus in the morning, I come in, I turn the lights on, I leave, turn the lights off. So he's pretty good with that, um, that lighting situation. Rodents or your animals that are nocturnal are going to be able to handle lower level lights and you can actually mess around with an animal's photo period. So when we're talking about lights, we're just talking about the actual light sources. When we talk about photo period, we're talking about the length of day and the night cycle. So this is where we can actually manipulate or change that cycle around. So when we have the hedgehog in the room, or even if we have the sugar gliders, we are able to kind of modify what their photo period is. So if we wanted the sugar gliders to come out while we're awake, we would wanna make a darker environment for them during the day and then put a light on for them at night because then that would change what they believed were light and dark. So um, for that to be successful, right? you can imagine we'd have to have our classroom dark all day and then turn a light on for them at night. Is that possible for us to do though? Mm, as fun as it might be, unfortunately, we really don't have that opportunity to do so. Um, but if you have an animal that is nocturnal at home, you can absolutely attempt to manipulate its photo period. So if you end up watching the sugar gliders or you have the hedgehog or you're taking home an animal that's nocturnal, you can provide it a darker space during the day and then at night, put a light on so that way it gets tripped. Okay, next we talk about ventilation. So if I'm ventilating something, you guys see this nice, awesome picture, fresh air in, stale air out. So I'm moving the air around, okay? So I wanna move the air around so because it was going to get rid of some of those icky things that are in the air. So ventilation is gonna be good for airflow. It controls odors. It also is gonna control those airborne microorganisms. So there is nothing worse than having an animal express its anal glands and then not be able to put on a, van, a fan. We actually have in my emergency clinic, our switch for the fan, for the, for the ventilation is a fart fan, right? So that we kick that on if there is an extra stanky thing going on in the clinic. So. It's also going to help move around those airborne microorganisms. With ventilation, you do want to limit any drafts, and this can be a hot draft or it can be a cold draft. So if you have the air ducts in the uh, animal enclosure right underneath where the heat vent comes from, that's not going to be great for the animal because you have a sudden drastic change in temp. You also have the wind and wind blowing. Uh, you guys know from when you step outside and it gets windy, you can get goosebumps, the hair raises on the back of your neck, this, that, and the other thing. So we do want to limit giraffes. We also want to always provide, if we have animals outside, we always want to provide a shaded area for them as well. So that way they can get out of the sunlight. Some of our animals can be very sensitive for their eyes with the sun. So we want to just be mindful of that and always provide them a place where there is shade. All right, so housing our animals. You see a nice chicken coop up top, and then we have an enclosure with a cat at the bottom. That is typical of what you might find at an animal shelter. First and foremost, we want to make sure that we're preventing any contamination of the animal from its feces or urine. Pretty much keep it clean, right? If the animal defecates or urinates in its enclosure, you need to clean that out right away. So if you have a hospitalized patient or a dog in a kennel, you need to make sure that if it urinates on the puppy pad, you change out that puppy pad. If it's in a kennel run, you're cleaning that kennel run um, every single day, sometimes twice a day, depending on your animal. If it's a puppy pad, as soon as you see it, you record it if need be, and then you change it out. So always keeping those items clean. We do a pretty good job of that in the classroom. And that's one of the reasons why I stress that particular piece of things where we're always cleaning, even if we don't see it, 
there may be something there. So we want to make sure that we're cleaning it. Another thing that we do, and you guys may not have realized it, but we have our behavioral enrichment items. What these do is actually provide comfort to the animals. It gives them an opportunity to play with each other. So with the sugar gliders, or they can play with the toys with each other. It also, for Nala, gives her an opportunity to be able to play and interact with her environment. So you guys have been able to really see how funny she gets when she carries her little toys up in her bed. And if you haven't yet, it's adorable. Um, but it keeps her occupied, right? So it's nice because she doesn't get bored. You might see those animals in zoos or aquariums where they're just pacing back and forth. And that pacing is a boredom behavior. Sometimes it, it becomes a learned behavior. And so they just always do it, even if there's a whole bunch of toys in the environment. Um, but other times it's a really good indicator that something's going on and that you need to stimulate those animals. Uh, a really great way to limit or be able to prevent diseases is by housing your species separately. So when we start to see in zoos a mixed species exhibit, there is going to be more chance, depending on the species, that they're going to be able to pass diseases on to each other. So if we house them separately, it's going to be, it's going to minimize that re, that risk. Um, even between our bearded dragons, we always, we should, we don't always, but we should wash our hands in between touching each of them, just in case one of them is more, is carrying something that the other one doesn't have yet, and we don't know it. It's great, so we're not cross-contaminating or, or going from one to the other um, with any possible microorganisms. We also want to make sure that we wash the surfaces. So if you guys take a look at that chicken coop picture up there, there's a whole bunch of items in there, which is awesome, but there could be nails sticking out of the wood of the two by four. So we're always going to monitor what our enclosures are made out of, what surfaces are in there, if I'm done with that cat, I'm going to make sure that that little nest box that's in there um, doesn't have any sharp edges on it. So that way the animal cannot hurt itself, right? So I'm going to make sure and a great way to prevent those diseases is just watching and monitoring what I actually have in the enclosure. All right. Also make sure that the housing is constructed in such a manner that the animal is not going to escape. And also that vermin cannot get in. So vermin are going to be mice and rodents or other things that might steal the food from your animals or might bring in other diseases. So when I worked as an animal keeper at Brookfield, um, we had baby roadrunners. And so we had this outside enclosure, and I don't know if you guys remember when you were super little before that wild encounters area was there. Uh, they had a row of enclosures that had, one of them had a red-tailed hawk, they had raccoons, and there was probably, the enclosure outside was probably maybe an inch by inch or maybe two inch, two inch squares is what the kind of mesh was, and it was wire. And um, one night we left, the roadrunners were there, and I came back in the morning, and I was checking on all the animals, and our run is what we call it, and it legit looks like a cartoon where the feathers were in a circle. Half of the circle was inside of the enclosure, and the other half of the circle was on the outside of the enclosure, so the roadrunner was asleep for the night, and it was sleeping right next to that wire. Well, a raccoon was able to get its hand into that two by two little square. Um, and so it was not a good ending for the Roadrunner. So you have to watch your housing and make sure that things are constructed properly and that items can't get in and your animals can't get out either. Um, make sure they're easy to clean and easy to sanitize. So we can kind of see when there's the guinea pigs in our classroom, right? They're kind of difficult. Um, it's not as easy to clean those. As, I, as we would like. Um, that's why though too with our reptiles, it's super easy to clean them, right? They're just in newspapers. So that is one of the reasons why we have the types of enclosures we do and the type of substrate that we have in those. So that way we can keep things nice and easy to clean. We also don't use plastic bowls too often because that is going to harbor or 
um, allow more and different bacteria or different types of pathogens to grow. So we use that stainless steel because those are that's easier to sanitize and to clean. Um, and we also want to make sure that our enclosures are lar large enough to provide a normal movement for our animals. So housing should allow an animal to do what it does. Yeah. So for a bird, ideally, your housing is going to be large enough that the animals can outstretch its wings. So if they can't outstretch their wings all the way, then that enclosure isn't going to meet its um, meet all of its needs, right? So for our bearded dragons, we want to make sure that our animal, our bearded dragons, can actually turn 360 in their enclosure without hitting it. So they have enough space that they can actually move and stretch out their whole body. All right, so now we've talked about housing. So then we have the next is animal identification. So you guys remember all those cows in that picture. Well, how do we keep all those cows straight? And if we remember Dory, she's got a little tag with a number on it. So depending on the animal is going to kind of dictate what type of identification markings you use. So for fish, we can use tags. That makes it really nice and easy. Um, we can't really clip their fins uh, because they need their fins. So if we make any modifications to their fins, that's going to affect how they're swimming. Um, but they also, fish will bite each other's fins anyway, so it's not necessarily gonna be helpful if we, um, do notches in their fins. So dogs and cats with microchip. You guys were able to see Zeus's microchip on his radiograph the other day. So we use microchips for those dogs and cats. We're also starting in dogs and cats, starting to use tattoos for our female animals to or indicate that they've been spayed. Because if you look at a female animal, if they're abdomen has healed up and they don't have a scar anymore and even if they did you don't know what that scar is from you can't look at a female animal and say that it's been spayed versus looking at an animal uh, male so we use microchips for identification we can also use tattoos for other forms of identification or if we want to indicate something's happened to our animal livestock there's a few different things we can do we can brand so branding is you have hot branding, you also have cold branding. So you can do both where it's one extreme of the temp or the other extreme of the temperature. It pretty much burns or cauterizes the skin. Um, so branding should be done at a very early age because it can cause pain. Uh, we have ear tags, so where we can just go ahead and pierce the ear pretty much with a name tag. And then we have something called ear notching. So that ear notching, is when we are actually kind of cropping pieces of the ear off. Or if you think about when you get your ear pierced, or if you think of somebody with their ear gauged and you have super huge um, gauged ears, what we do is with animals, we kind of take the piercing gun and instead of poking a straight hole, we just clip off a little piece of that ear. So I did some mice research where I had just, it was a hole punch. It was just a single hole punch and I would hole punch a particular pattern in those the ears of the um, the mice to be able to identify them with birds we use leg bands so we'll band them the particular left or right leg um, depending on who's banding can tell you the sex of the bird if they've sexed them and then they have some sort of number sequence letter number sequence on the band so birds tend to have leg bands Livestock, band, uh, branding, ear tags, ear notching, cats and dogs, we tend to use microchips. The ferrets, if you look at Marshall Farms ferrets, they have little tattoos on them. Um, rabbits will also on the inside of their ears or even some of your animals. If you look in their cheeks, underneath that front lip, they'll have a tattoo. Um, they'll actually, I believe it's different equine species, they'll tattoo right up in there. Um, Microchips and tattoos are going to be better than any collars or name tags, right? So if I have an animal coming in, um, I'm not necessarily that collar may fall off with those names.
here. It's a mess. Um, we do a good amount of disinfecting in the classroom. We haven't sterilized anything yet, um, and we try to sanitize as well. So we have to make sure that we are aware of what those three things are, because there's a difference. Um, I can disinfect an inanimate object, okay? So your tables you're sitting on, when we clean them with the rescue, that's what we're doing, we're disinfecting them. So we're destroying pathogenic microorganisms and the tox or other toxins on inanimate objects. And we're talking about inanimate objects, when we say that, we're talking about fomites, so right? Inanimate object that can carry a disease-causing agent. Um, so to disinfect something means I'm getting rid of that and destroying it. If I'm a sanitizer, so think about those hand sanitizers. They reduce the number of microorganisms to a safe level without completely eliminating them. So if I'm using hand sanitizer, I am not getting rid of all of the microorganisms on my hand. Because if I did that, I would be hurting myself, yeah? And that's where some controversy actually will come up with my with your hand sanitizers because it does reduce the number of so many different microorganisms. And some of them are actually good in helping to prevent your diseases. Um, but to sanitize something, I'm limb reducing the amount of microorganisms to a level that's safe, to a level that's not really going to affect that animal. Um, then we have sterilizers. So to sterilize something is to completely destroy all of the microorganisms by some use of chemical or other agents. So I can only sterilize an inanimate object. We have seen, if you guys take a look at the classroom, there's that giant metal weird thing that looks like a microwave or something from 1950s. It is actually what we call an autoclave. So that is a steam pressure sterilizer, okay? So I can sterilize my forceps. I can sterilize my towels. I can sterilize cotton gauze. If I put the bearded dragon in the autoclave to sterilize it, it would not be coming out alive anymore, right? Because it would be destroyed. I would destroy those cells. So I'm not ever gonna put an animal in an um, autoclave. And you're going to be careful when you work with autoclaves because it's high pressure and high temperature steam. So when we disinfect, we're talking about destroying um, pathogenic microorganisms on fomites. So I can disinfect tables. I don't disinfect me. I can sanitize me. Um, so to sanitize then is reducing that number of microorganisms to a safe level. Um, I'm not necessarily completely eliminating them, right? Because I'm still going to have some sort of level on that of microorganisms. So an example is going to be to clean uh, my leg before I insert a needle to draw blood. So we watched those videos on restraint. We we're talking about pulling cephalic blood. Um, or placing an IV catheter. So we sanitize that area, we clean it. That chlorhexidine solution is a great sanitizer. Um, so when we do that with our animals and that's one reason, right? We're trying to reduce that level of microorganisms. Okay, so when we're housing our animals, we also need to make sure that our physiological needs of our animals are met. So if you take a look there, Hopefully you remember what kind of bird that is, um, but that is an African gray. Um, so to make sure that we're making and getting our physiological needs met of our animals, we want to pet, talk to them, touching them, like petting some of your animals is really going to help establish a rapport. Some of your animals like zoos doesn't really like to be pet or they like to be pet on their own terms. So you have to watch that. Not all animals are cuddly. Um, you need to make sure to providing some gentle reassurance and support during an exam. Some of your animals are really going to do well when they're talked to, when you coo at them and say, it's okay, Fluffy, like you're doing fine. Um, or Zeus is going to be Zeus, like just stop, you're good. Um, I talk to him differently than I talk to my dog. Um, that's just part of it just changes, right? Different animals you talk to a little bit differently. And if you don't, then you don't. That's awesome because all of our animals, we really need to be treating them with the same amount of respect. So gentle reassurances, some support during the exam is going to be helpful. Um, and you can see how engaged that African gray is in that toy over there. So if you can provide toys or some sort of enrichment, 
that would be great. Even if that enrichment is changing the texture of the towel. So if you have an animal that you can put a towel in its enclosure, put the towel in its enclosure, change it up. Maybe it's a fleece towel today. Maybe it's a um, one of those fuzzy wool blankets tomorrow. Um, but textures are really nice to mess around with. It's easy to mess around with textures um, as far as just you can switch things in and out. The egg cartons, um, anything you can use to help enrich the environment is going to be a plus. You know, it keeps them engaged. And it makes things from being boring. You guys don't like it when you're in the same spot all the time, right? It's nice to have something that changes up. Okay, so when we're talking about uh, healing and repair of damaged tissues. This is also a preventative disease um, issue. You can see that is a dog right there with a lovely laceration. Um, so healing the repair of your tissue begins immediately after it's injured. So as soon as it's sliced open, you have a trigger reaction, and so therefore your skin is going to start to heal itself. Um, healing is the last step. Uh, completed in the inflammatory response. So first I repair, right? I'm going through repairing, then to heal it is actually the very last thing. We have something called fibrosis, and that's just fibrosis is when we're talking about scarring. It's the end result of our tissue repair, um, except for your central nervous system. So your central nervous system doesn't repair the same way as the other pieces. So or as the other pieces of your body. So when we have damaged nerve fiber, that nerve fiber, depending on where it's at, is not going to become repaired. So when I, t when I damage my brain tissue, my brain tissue is done. I can't heal that. We don't have the mechanisms in our body to do so. Now they're doing a lot of different research and trying to see if they can't solve that or, or mitigate some of that. But right now, we really can't. Once our brain cells are done, they're done. Um, and we talk about repair of wounds happening either in a first intention healing or a second intention healing. Um, and we'll go over that a little bit more later when we talk about wound bandaging. Uh, we have fever. So fever is that abnormal, abnormal increase in body temperature. And it's caused by a release of what we call pryogens. And pryogens are released from our white blood cells. So that's what's going to cause a fever to happen. And then inflammation, of course, is our heat, redness, swelling, pain, and possible loss of function. So I may get stung by a bee, and I might be allergic. And so my hand swells up really, really bad, and then I can't use my fingers because I can't move them because the tissue is so swollen. So um, if something's inflamed, there should be a heat to it some redness, possibly swelling, pain, and a possible loss of function. All right, then we come to vaccinations. To vaccinate or not to vaccinate, that is the question. There's a great deal of controversy in the media about vaccinations and what vaccinations do, what vaccinations are, what happens with vaccines. Um, some people will say they don't vaccinate because they believe it is linked to autism. There is no scientific evidence that is backing that up. Um, so as far as we know, there's really no reason not to vaccinate, or at least no scientifically sound backed reason not to vaccinate um, for just a, a purpose of, oh, I'm not going to vaccinate because I don't want to vaccinate. Um, but it does depend. Some animals will have reactions to vaccines. So some of you already know Nala when she got her last distemper, uh, she had a vaccine reaction to it. So now I am going to have to figure out for her next vaccine is she still going to get vaccinated or are we just going to not let her go through that? Um, luckily, her reaction wasn't that bad. So we'll vaccinate again. We'll monitor her reaction to it. Um, I've had a friend that she could not vaccinate her animals because it would cause to, um, potential death. So she did not vaccinate and that was, she was aware of that. Um, but there are, you have to think about the risk of exposure to a pathogen. If I live in a place that I'm never gonna be exposed, if I'm in Antarctica, I'm not gonna be exposed to heartworm. I'm not gonna vaccinate for heartworm. 
not that you can because there's no vaccination for it, um, but you can take preventative medicine, right? So if I live in a place that I'm never going to get it, I'm not going to necessarily take preventative medicine if it's not around. Some people will think about the cost of the vaccine. Some vaccines might be too expensive for you to give, so it might just be easier or it might be more cost effective to take your chances. And if the animal gets the disease in which you could have vaccinated from, maybe it's cheap enough that you can just pay for the medication and the treatment. And so that's a, a cost benefit analysis, really. Um, you have to think about some of the benefits of the vaccine, which are a lot, because then your animal's not gonna get the disease and it's protected. So if I live down south, you better believe I'm gonna make sure that I vaccinate against any diseases that are carried through ticks that I can vaccinate against because it's always warm there. At least when we're up here, we have that cool cycle. Now that doesn't mean I can't get those diseases. It just means they're not as prevalent. So depending on what my animal does, I may or may not vaccinate. If you guys are boarding your animals, so you have a dog, you are required to get a border tele vaccine or the kennel cough vaccination because there's so many animals that are within a single spot. But if I never board my dog and my dog never goes with other animals, I don't need to give it a border tele vaccine. It's not gonna be introduced to any other dogs and if that's where it can contract the disease and then I'm not exposing it to that risk. Um, you have to think about the effects of the disease caused by the pathogen, right? So what's gonna happen if my animal gets this? And then there may be an association between vaccines and sarcomas in cats. So a sarcoma is going to be, uh, the oma is that tumor or lump, right? So you may end up getting a lump of, of fluid in the skin and you may get a pocket there. And so that's just a risk that you have to be aware of, but I'd rather vaccinate my cat for rabies um, and then just deal with it getting a uh, possible sarcoma, right? So again, just weighing out what are your options. We have what we call core vaccines and we have non-core vaccines. So a core vaccine is recommended for all of your animals of a species. So rabies is a core vaccine, yeah? So all of our animals are gonna be exposed to rabies. They're not, they're not going to be exposed to rabies, but they could get rabies. And so we wanna make sure that we vaccinate against that because we don't want our animals to have rabies. Um, so that's a core vaccine. These are recommended for all of our animals of all of the species. They're targeted against infectious, infectious agents, which are gonna have fatal effects or extreme effects, right? So core vaccine, um, again, we've got rabies. And then with your dogs, it's also going to be, there's a few different lettering for it, but it's for distemper and leptospirosis is what, or it's a distemper vaccine. It vaccinate, vaccinates against leptospirosis and um, some other, some other things. Um, and those can be fatal. And so I wanna make sure that I vaccinate against what those things are. So that way my dog doesn't accidentally die. Uh, we have non-core vaccines. These are vaccines that are recommended uh, due to risk exposure. So again, Bordetella. Um, if I don't board my dog, I don't need to get it. So it's not core vaccine. Uh, Lyme disease. If you live in the city and you never let your dog roam around in the grass and you're not going to tall woods, chances of you're exposing your animal to a tick that might have Lyme disease is pretty slim to none versus somebody who is going hunting with their animal and is gonna go get some ducks and they're gonna bring their animal through the brush and the dog is going to be able to be in close contact with ticks. Or if you go to the forest preserve and you walk your animal, or if you have an outside and you have some trees or you have some tall grasses, um, there's a chance there, there's going to be ticks, so there's a chance of exposure to Lyme disease and other tick-borne diseases. So in that case, then, I will vaccinate, um, but those are non-core, so I don't need to do it. It just all depends on the lifestyle of my animal. 
All right, when we talk about vaccinations, we can break vaccines into three different types. We have killed or inactivated vaccines. Now, this is when we've taken that microorganism, whether it be a virus, whether it be a bacteria, whether it be a prion, um, we've killed the pathogen or selected the antigenic subunits. So it is going to be injected into your vaccine. It's part of what makes it, but it's not active. It's, it's killed. It's just there. It's just there. It's going to irritate things. It can't replicate. It can't do anything. And it's dead. It's inactive. Um, but it's going to stimulate their immune response. Then we would call a modified live vaccine. Modified live vaccine is weakened. It still has the ability, though, to kind of function similar to that of the microorganism it's representing because it's the actual microorganism. Um, so modified live vaccines should not be able to replicate. But in some cases, they can replicate depending on the immune response of the individual that's becoming vaccinated. So modified live disease, modified live vaccines are weakened. Um, it's kind of like if you've ever heard that movie. Um, so Princess Bride, when he talks about being only mostly dead. So that's kind of your modified live vaccines. If you haven't seen the movie, highly recommend it. And then we have what we call recombinant vaccines. So these are live non-pathogenic virus or bacteria into which the gene for the pathogen related antigen has been inserted. So I have a bacteria, whatever this microorganism is, it's not any bad type of a thing. It's just here is this little plain old piece of bacteria. It's mine and its own business. And then what I come around and do, I inject the DNA or the RNA sequence of the pathogen that I want to vaccinate against, I inject that into that bacteria, that microorganism, that was mine its own business, and then that's what I'm utilizing to create the immune response. So recombinant, think about I'm recombining, right? I'm combining things. So you're taking a bacteria that is harmless, you are injecting a DNA structure sequence into it so it then mimics or mirrors an actual pathogen. Um, so that then is going to elicit the response. So that's what's going to get your vaccine to work.